CSS and H or, or uh, with CSS, we, we still have the, the same um, fact that there are design issues and there are um, technical issues. In other words, we can make every tag on our page look different, have a different color, have a different font, and so on. But that's hardly a good idea. All right, it's it's overkill. Remember that that why you're doing things on your page. You're doing things to give emphasis, to give organization, and to create a mood. That's why we would use colors and fonts and so on. And we'll talk more about this going forward. But if you think about giving emphasis, if you give emphasis by having something in a different color, if you have 10 different colors on your page, then the, the, the thing that you're trying to give emphasis to is going to be lost, right? Whereas if you have everything on your page the same color, but one section is a different color, that really focuses the user on that. So you can't, um, you know, you, you, you can overdo this stuff quite easily. And the idea should be using these things in CSS that we're going to review to um, help communicate the message, help emphasize the stuff, help the user visually organize the page. All right? So if you put borders around things or if you make, give a different background color or whatever, in effect what you're doing for the user is you're grouping things together. So at a glance they can see what the page is. But again, if you overuse these things, then it becomes a distraction and, and the users lose sense and they're not getting a, a clear message. All right? You know, can you imagine um, if at every intersection the stop sign was a, a different color, a different shape, and maybe even in a different position? All right? That'd be chaos, right? You know, people at a glance know that if they see a, a what is that, octagon that is red, even before they can read the word stop, they know it's a stop sign. And it's typically in the same position every time. And uh, therefore, that kind of consistency is very useful when people are trying to, to negotiate their way through the highways. We want to achieve a similar sort of consistency. So we want our pages to look consistent. All right? And we don't want to overdo by having too much going on on the pages. All right. One of the fundamental rules I said about design is that similar things or like things should look the same. So for example, if we have warnings on our different pages, it'd be nice if all the warnings looked the same. All right? If we have a background image on our page, it would be nice if the background image was consistent and the same. If every page on a website looked different, then that would be sort of a disorienting, disorienting experience for the user. The user is liable to think, you know, it's so easy, you know, to start off looking for one thing on the web and end up on a totally different site, that if your website doesn't sort of have some cohesion and some coherence to it, you're liable to confuse the user into thinking, hey, I ended up on some other site by clicking a link. So you want it to be consistent. So I took, uh, right before class, I took a couple of the pages that we were looking at, uh, at last time and I tweaked them a little bit so that we could have two pages about skiing. All right, and we can imagine we have a site about skiing and here's two pages of the site. So let's look at the two pages and they should look familiar to you. The one page looks like this, all right, has the image of the skiing and has some Greek text there just as a placeholder and has uh, the image and has sort of a nice little snowflake as a background. It, it's, it's unobtrusive, we edited it to make it sort of faded so we don't lose our text on top of it, you know. While this wouldn't necessarily win any design awards, it's a, a legible enough, attractive enough looking page for the purpose of our discussion. We then created another page another way, all right? And we had a different kind of background on this, all right? And this is our second page. Now, obviously if these are two pages on the site, they don't look at all alike. You know, there's a different background color and that, that could really be potentially um, disorienting for a user. So we want them to use the same CSS, all right, same CSS code. So how do we do that? Well, 
The only way that we, we know to do it so far, based on what we've covered in the class, would be to go and open up this guy, copy the CSS code, and put it in this one. All right. While I'm here, I'm going to make links to the two pages. So now they should look the same. Because I've copied and pasted the CSS code between the two pages. All right. So if I look at page one, it looks like it did before. If I go to the second page, it now has a similar look to it. All right. And again, I'm a little thin on content, but you know that it should have more stuff on it. All right. Now, that's all well and good. And we could do this to every page on our site. But what if someone comes in and says, you know, I don't like that font. All right. That's the basic default font times New Roman. I want instead of this, I want a sans serif font, like Ariel or Verdana, let's say. What's the difference between a serif and a sans serif font? Uh, a serif font has these little thingies on the end of them, on the end of letters, called serifs. And a sans serif font doesn't. Sans, if I remember my two years of high school French, means without. All right. I think. So let's go and let's make some big old letters to, to get a closer look at this. So let's make a gigantic letter. And I'll make the first one in Times New Roman, which is a serif font, like a default font. So there's a the letter A in Times New Roman. And I'll make it bigger still if I can. Let me zoom in instead. All right, there we go. If I were to make an A in a sans serif font, such as Verdana, the A looks like this. The difference between the two is the A in Times New Roman has these little feet on the end. I guess feet is the best way I can put it. Little thingies. I don't know. Can anyone have a better word uh, for that? And those are called serifs. Whereas the sans serif font um, doesn't have those things on the, on the end. So I could say, you know what? I like the sans serif font better. The sans serif font looks cleaner and so on. All right. There's any number of reasons you choose a font. Let's just say for the sake of argument, I like the font Verdana. All right. So I'm going to go and I'm going to put it on my page. So let's go and let's do that. And how do I do that? Well, that's an aspect of the appearance, right? That isn't any content. It's the same words regardless of the font. So therefore, it's something I'm going to do in the CSS. So I could go in here and say font. I always screw this up. I always get confused between font family and font face. All right. So I go and I add the attribute for the font. And how do I add it? Well, so far we've only been doing, or we've been mostly doing colors, but we can put any number of different kinds of attributes here. So on the body tag, 
We've set our background image. I can then put a semicolon and have the next property, which is a font family, and I'll make it Verdana. I can go and save that, and I can go and look at our first page again, and notice that the font is changed. It's no longer the Times New Roman, it's Verdana. However, where's the catch? The catch is, is that second page is still in the old font. All right. Well, what's the answer? Do I cut and paste again? Yeah, I guess I could. All right. But imagine if you're talking about a larger website where there's dozens of pages. That would get to be a pain to do. All right. Um, probably one of the main reasons that I got into and have stayed in the software and, uh, development is that the quality of laziness, which in most occupations is a negative thing, for software developers, laziness is actually kind of a good thing, provided it's the right kind of laziness. All right? What do I mean by the right kind of laziness? You know, so, you know, don't go home and say, well, I'm not going to read it because Zeller says I'm supposed to be lazy uh, in this class. No, that's not what I mean. The right kind of laziness is a laziness that says, I'm going to do a little bit of work now to save me from a ton of extra work later. So, it's the old work smarter, not harder idea. So in this case, the idea is, is it would be nice if I could put my CSS code somewhere so that I only have to change it in one place and that change will be reflected throughout all my pages. And that's what we're going to do. There's a good uh, slogan for programmers. DRY. And that stands for do not repeat yourself. This kind of thinking applies sort of regardless of the kind of software that you're working on. Whether you're talking about web pages or, or desktop programming or mobile programming or any sort of software development that you do, your goal is to not repeat yourself. Your goal is to not have to change two things if something changes. Ideally, if something changes, in this case the font changed, but I could change the background image or the color or any number of different attributes. The idea is, is if that changes, I should only have to make the change in one place. That is as close to a golden rule as anything in software development. If any of you have done database stuff, all right, in databases, what happens if we get a new category of product? You should only have to change that one place, all right. What if someone moves and we change and they change their address? Should only have to change that in one place. All right. Almost everything we do in terms of software development, and again, web development, software development, there's a lot of parallels between the two. Almost anything we do in the realm of development that we call a good practice is a good practice because it's a form of inspired laziness. All right. It's a form of keeping us from having to repeat ourselves. So. What's the answer here? The answer here is for us to take the CSS code and put it in a separate file. All right. We've talked about the separation of presentation and content, you know, the HTML being the content of the page, the presentation being the way it looks, which is in the CSS file. Now we're going to separate them quite literally. We're going to put them in two different files. The advantage of putting them in the separate files is that a lot of pages can look at the same CSS file. We can share that CSS code throughout a bunch of pages. So let's go and do that now. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to go and I'm going to cut out my style code out of the page. I'm eventually going to do this to both pages, but I'm going to start out doing it to the one. I'm going to create a file that contains only the style rules. I don't need the style tag in an external style sheet. This is, by the way, called an external style sheet. In other words, it's style sheet code that's external to the HTML. And when I do it that way, I don't need 
the style tag. The browser knows that CSS code another way. All right. And I'm going to go and save this. And I'll put it where the rest of my stuff lives. And I'm going to call it main.css, my main style sheet. All right. So I have the code, and I've put it in a file all by itself. Now what I have to do is point each of my two pages and say, hey, get your style information from this file. All right? And it's real straightforward how you do that. I was demonstrating something wrong last time and I forgot to save it and correct it. So let me go and correct that. All right. Still is in the head section, but we don't have a style tag. Instead, we say link type equals text slash CSS rel equals style sheet href equals and then the name of our style sheet file which is simply main.css so now I go and save that and I bring up this page and the style is there for it now I'm going to go and do this on the other page as well. Ideally, you'll do this right from the start, right? The only reason I didn't do it from the start is I wasn't ready to discuss this part yet in class. So typically, you'll create the style sheet file when you create your web page. And then every page that you create that goes together will point to the same style sheet. All right. So there we go. And now, notice that that second page does have the same styling as the first page. Now, here's where it gets really good. This is two pages. It can work the same way if you're having 100 pages. All right, doesn't matter. All of them point to the same style sheet file, which means that, like that, I can change every page of the site to look different. So, I decide I don't like that stupid snowflake, all right? I want instead just to have a plain yellow background. Sometimes I make it real ugly to make it noticeable, all right? So, let's say I don't want that snowflake. I want just a plain yellow background. I can go into the style sheet file, edit it, change the background from what it was to yellow, and while we're at it, let's make it really ugly and make the color of the text blue. Eh, it might not be too bad. We'll see. And bang. That page is yellow with a blue text. This page is yellow with a blue text. So we now have it so that because we've isolated that CSS into separate files and all the web pages point to that they use a link tag to point to it now that's not the same kind of link as when you link to a page it's a different kind of thing but since it's linked to it all I have to do is change it in one spot and that change gets reflected throughout that my boss comes in and says oh on second thought that yellow's ugly put it back the way it was it's just a matter of going in and changing the code back to what it was, and ah. 
One thing you'll notice, notice that I had no semicolon there to separate the rules. Notice what happened. None of the style sheet applied. If you go and you are not getting your styles, that means that you probably have a syntax error somewhere in there. So again, when I saw that I wasn't getting the background, and in fact I'm not getting the correct font, it's because I left out the semicolon there. And now we're back in business. So now, what kinds of things can we do with this? Wow, we can do a lot of stuff with this. All right, we can do uh, a, a lot of stuff with this. Um, and the nice thing is, is whatever we change, will get changed in both places. So let's go and play around with this. And let's make some changes to our CSS. All right. Let's first of all go in and let's center our H1. All right. A lot of times people, instead of having everything be left justified, they want to have the, the, the stuff centered. So I can center my H1. H1. And I can do that with the text-align property. And I can say center. And there, centered there, go to the second page, centered there as well. Maybe I want to do the same thing with the H2. I can do that to the H2. All right, both the first and the second page. All right. Now, how did I know that that was text aligned center? Because I've done this a million times. All right. Those of you that have not done this a million times, um, how will you learn this stuff? Well, eventually you will do it a million times and you'll know it by then. But prior to that, um, there's a number of good resources. The book has examples of stuff and W3Schools, which is a great resource, has um, tutorials for CSS. Let's go and visit some of those. If I go to W3Schools Online Tutorial and I want to learn CSS, it shows me all the things I can do with CSS. So for example, styling background, styling text, styling font, styling lists, and so on. So maybe I can look and style text. I can go in and I can, for example, oh, let's see what do I want to do. More examples, there we go. Specify the space between characters. All right. I have to confess, I don't know how to do that. I mean, I know you can do that. All right. But I don't know specifically how to do that. Why? Because I probably haven't done that a million times. I probably have only done that a few dozen times. All right. The point I'm trying to get is that it's very difficult to know all of the CSS properties. What will help you is this. First of all, realizing that if it has to do with appearance, you're going to do it in CSS. So don't look for some HTML tag to control the space between the letters. That's one thing. Secondly, get a general idea of what the capabilities are for CSS and know then that, gee, if I want to control the spacing that I might look in this place and, and find an answer. So let's go and look here. And the tag is letter spacing. Or the, the attribute is letter, letter spacing. So I could maybe, for example, in my H1, letter spacing of 5px. That will put 5 pixels between each letter. So I will space it out, like maybe I want to do with a heading. I can save it. 
and now notice how winter sports is spread out more than it was before. All right. Okay. You might say to yourself that this article here in the middle extends the width of the whole page, right? If you think of how a newspaper works, let's see if this. As is an example. But if you think of a newspaper, print on a newspaper doesn't go all the way across the page. All right? Why not? Well, because your eye has a tendency, if it's traveling across the width of a page, to maybe move up or down. So you're able to start out reading a sentence on line five, and as your eye travels across the screen, you may look down and look up, or look up, and. Therefore, you get the first part of the sentence from line three, you get the second part of the sentence from line four, and it seems like nonsense to you. All right? That's why some people, when they read, and I even do it sometimes if the, if the print is small, will take and like put a pencil like this. All right? If something's hard to read, that can help you read the material by, by making sure your eye goes across. Well, you can imagine this text and even on a bigger monitor still, we could run into this problem with this text. So one thing that we might want to do is we might want to narrow the width of the text, all right, of that article. Instead of going all the way across the screen, maybe we only want it to go a certain portion across the screen. So we can do that via the width attribute. What is it that I want to change? I want to make all my articles. What about the articles? I don't want them to be 100% of the screen. I want them to be a certain width. Let's, in our first pass, make the width be 400 pixels. All right. And that makes an article go down and only be 400 pixels wide. All right. One way we can specify width is through pixels. In other words, the pixel is like a dot on the screen. You know, if you look real closely at a screen, you'll notice everything on the screen is a series of little dots. All right. Um, a pixel is one of those dots. All right. So I made it 400 wide. This monitor is like a thousand and change wide. I'm not sure exactly how big it is, but it's a thousand and some wide. So if you notice, that's about 40% of the width. The other way that I can express the width of something is with percentages. So I can go and I can say the width of this, I don't want to be 400 pixels. I want it to be, let's say, 60% of the page. All right. Now notice what happens. As I resize this window, it gets bigger and narrower. Which is a good thing. All right. It's a good thing because what if I was reading this page on a mobile phone? All right. I have a piece of software here called a mobile emulator which shows us how a page is going to look on a mobile phone. So I can say I want to emulate an HTC Hero. And that's what the screen looks like. That's about that's the size of the screen of an HTC Hero. Can go and bring this over and it shows me how it's going to appear there. All right. Which is smaller than how it would appear um, on the screen. Uh, a computer screen, that is. Well, a full screen. Like if, you it at 400. if 
I kept it at 400 pixels, it would be 400 pixels. So if I went here, and let's go back and change it. If I make this, let's make it, I want to make this for deliberately a big number, 750 pixels. All right. Did I forget to save it? I actually need to add a line of code to make this work. And if you don't follow what this line does, don't worry about it. I teach mobile web development um, here on, on uh, Wednesday evenings. So I am going to borrow a snippet of code that will help us visualize what the issue is. put it in both of our pages. Because without this line of code, the phone does some resizing on its own. And that was interfering with my CSS code. So now let's go in and bring up my HTC Hero. I made the width of this be 750 pixels. Notice what happens is, actually it adjusted it for me, interestingly enough. It did not do that for the image though. make sure I've saved this. The point is, if you make it, if you use an absolute number, depending on the screen size, here I can show it uh, in uh, the desktop browser, maybe better. If I make it a fixed size, if the window gets smaller, I can have some side scrolling to deal with. And you kind of don't want to do that. Typically, it's sort of better if you can do things with percentages as opposed to, to absolute numbers. To start out using absolute numbers as, as we're learning working through is, is, is okay. Because that can help us get an exact layout. But as we go forward and as mobile becomes more and more important, um, we're going to we're going to start using uh, relative numbers a lot more. All right, so let's go and view this here, and we'll see that we'll see a couple things. What's odd about the title skiing? It's not centered. I thought we said to center it. We did. H2 is centered. Hmm. We have to understand what center means. All right. What center means is put it centered within the container. All right. So in this case, 
that H2 is within the article. So it will be centered within the article, not centered within the web page. So I made that, that article be 750 pixels wide, so this is going to be centered within that 750 pixels. We can more or less show that to you, demonstrate that to you, by putting a background color on the article. Now we can see, sure enough, skiing is centered, but it's centered within the article, not centered within. So when we talk about CSS going forward, a lot of our discussion, especially when we use percentages and center and alignment, is going to surround that that's going to be based on the container, not the whole web page. All right? We probably could, but the other thing, probably the bigger issue is we want that article probably to be centered as well, right? Because that kind of looks a little awkward. Especially, let's go and let's make this a percentage. Let's make this at 50%. Oops. Even if we were to center that, over there, this is going to look awkward like this. And again, notice as I resize it, oops, as I resize it, the skiing heading moves. All right. So the question is, is how do I center the article? I can center the article by giving it a margin. All right, and this is a code to do that. A margin in HTML, or CSS rather, is similar to a margin that you'd have in Word or whatever. All right, in Word, there's actually four margins. All right, on any page, there's four margins, right? There's the top, right, bottom, and left. In CSS, you can set the margin in all directions. You can set the margin for the top and the left. You can set the margin for the top, left, bottom, and right. It sort of goes like a clock. In other words, for this particular example, the top margin is going to be 0 px. So that's the top of the clock. The right margin is going to be automatically calculated. In other words, it's going to center it. It's going to calculate how big it needs to be to fit in the center. The bottom, and then you start looping around again. The bottom margin will be 0 pixels as well. And the, and the left margin will be automatic. So if I make this change, I now have this page where the article is centered. Let me go and get rid of that background color because I just had it to demonstrate a point. And we can see how I want it to look like that. I make it smaller. And again, everything pretty much stays centered. Now these specific rules that I'm going over are rules that you probably will use pretty often. A lot of times people want things to be nice and centered on their page. So yeah, you're going to center things a lot. But keep in mind, more so than the specific attributes and commands I'm doing, is the whole mindset of if it has to do with the appearance, it's going to live in the CSS. And therefore I need to know what to work in the CSS to make it work the way that I want it to. All right. Yes. Yes. Is 
within the CSS file? Within the CSS file, it can be in any order that you want. And there's only a little catch to that. The little catch is if you happen to define a rule in two places, the second one takes precedence. One thing that you could do is you could put, if, if I wanted a logo and I wanted it on every page, I could, uh, I could potentially do it um, on this page or, or uh, on the CSS file. Let's pretend that this image is my logo, this little snowflake. All right. Oops. All right. I could go and do this, and I could say background URL images slash. Now this isn't going to work the way that that, that we're going to want it to work, right? Because we want this to be a logo. We want it to be just one image there on the side of the H1. All right? And it's not going to do that. All right? It went all the way across, all right? If we imagine this being a logo, um, we would only want one of those images to appear, right? So how could we make that happen? Well, by default, background images tile. But let's go to W3C and see if there's a way to, we can make it, uh, W3 schools, and see if there's a way we can make it not to tile. Learn CSS. Backgrounds. If we look here, there's an option that we can put called no repeat. So I can say no repeat. And then I only get one copy of the image. But we don't get really the full copy of the image, right? That, that's, that's only part of the image. The background only covers the content area. In other words, we need to make this bigger. We need to make that H1 bigger. So how big do we need to make it? This is 127 pixels big. So I can go in here and I can make a height of, on the H1, of 127 pixels. And now we have our logo there. Now you might say, okay, that's kind of what I want. Um, or maybe I don't want that to go all the way the full width of the screen. In which case I could go in and I could say the width on the H1, give it a width of 100, or I'm sorry, of 50% to match the width of the article. Oops. And then remember to center it. So there we have our logo um, next to the header in the header section. Again, assuming that little thingy is, is our company's logo.
No, no. Why did I say no before you even got the question out? Because I'm a mean person, right? Because, exactly. All right. Because we know we want to change the way it looks. The question was, I want to make this go down a little bit. All right. So I don't want this right up at the top. I want it to be like centered vertically. All right. So as soon as the student said, would I add another H1, I cut the student off. All right, why? Because this isn't an HTML change. We're not changing the content. All right, we're changing the way it looks. We're dropping it down a little bit. Now, this could probably be done a couple different ways. All right, the way I'm going to choose to do it is with a padding, which is the space between the edge of something and where the text starts. So I'm going to do padding top of 60 pixels, let's say. That pushed that down. Okay, maybe I don't want to go quite that much. Maybe I'll do 40 instead. All right, and there we go. So we got it alongside of it. Again, I'm throwing a lot of terms out at you and a lot of attributes, padding and margin and all that. These are ones that we're going to be using or we're going to be using a lot. And, uh, and I'm going to take the time to more formally de define them in upcoming classes. All right. But what are the lessons here today? All right. What are the takeaways that I want? Number one, I hope I've sold you once and for all on the benefits of having an external CSS file. Now with every rule, there's exceptions and we can talk about them, but there's no particular need to discuss the exceptions now. Everything you should do from this point forward should have an external CSS file. All right. Again, notice how clean it is to go to this page and that page looks the same. I go between the two and they look the same. All right. So number one, external CSS file. That will give a, a separation of the content and the presentation so I can change anything I want to in the presentation and that change will be made consistently across all pages that use that. Number two, I can change really any aspect of the appearance of the stuff on the page through CSS rules. All right. We talked about, uh, you know, color was the one that we started out with. We then added background images to it. I then played around today with the font, with the margins, with the padding. All those things relate to the spacing of the things on the page. All right? So I can control the way things are spaced. I can control the fonts. Really anything concerning the appearance of the page I can set and I can control via CSS. And what we're going to do for uh, the next while is, is study two different things. We're going to study more of those CSS rules and, and really understand what those things do. The second thing we're going to do, which we've sort of hinted at so far, is talk about additional ways to select items on the page. In other words, maybe, I can do this real quick. Maybe this article is a special article. I want it to look different, all right, because it discusses my fears about skiing downhill, all right, so I want it to look different. I can give it an ID, and then I can specify a style rule for that ID that takes precedence. So let's do a background 
of yellow. So now, this is a regular article that gets styled that way. On the second page, that article has been given a ID of style, so I can style that one that way. All right. So again, you know, I, I use just one example here. You can do IDs and you can do classes, and we'll spend some time talking about that. Remember, when all is said and done, CSS rules consist of, first of all, a selector. That selector defines what on the page gets the style. Then there's a list of style rules and attributes, or there's attributes and values, where I say specifically, what do I want to change about that thing? So there's a selector that says, who gets this rule? Then there's the rules that say, what's that thing going to look like? All right. We're going to beef up and we're going to study a lot more, both in terms of selectors and in terms of attributes. All right. My suggestion to you is don't hesitate to play around with this and experiment. All right. For those of you that have not enjoyed doing very dull Times New Roman font uh, with uh, a white background and black type, use this as a chance to really have some fun and, and explore CSS, even if we haven't covered it in class. All right. We will cover a lot more of this in class, but again, you're, you know, there's no way we can cover it all, so feel free to experiment and play around with it. All right. We'll see you over in lab. Yes. Tell you what, I'll do this. There you go. Let me know when you have it. You also know that you also know that I uh, I upload the example files too, okay. so you can just go in and grab the files. All right, excellent.